Crumbs is provided by the Nordson Corporation Foundation. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hewitt Shaw, the president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, Norman J. Ornstein, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. He also serves as an election analyst for CBS News, which no doubt is keeping him very busy these days, and is a weekly columnist for Ro Roll Call Magazine. He's also a regular editorialist and columnist for uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal, uh, Foreign Affairs magazines, and other major publications. He also appears regularly on television, perhaps most notably in this day and age, recently on The Jon Stewart Show. Uh, he has written many books, including It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Political Politics of Extremism, co-authored with Thomas E. Mann. I must also report to you that he received his PhD from the University of Michigan, well known for its academics. <laughs> Mr. Ornstein's affiliation with the American Enterprise Institute pro provides perhaps the best context for his remarks today. The AEI is an American nonpartisan think tank founded in 1943, and I quote, to defend the principles and improve the institutions of American freedom and capitalism. Limited government, private enterprise, individual liberty and responsibility, vigilant and effective defense and foreign policies, political accountability, and importantly for the City Club, open debate. The list of scholars of the AEI is a who's who list of the leading political commentators and figures of uh, today's political environment. In this era of heightened polemics in the political arena, which is even more evident in this political season, we are fortunate to have Mr. Ornstein with us today to comment on the issues of the day with a calmer and more thoughtful and perhaps more balanced voice than those that we may otherwise be hearing on the airwaves and reading online and in the print. I am pleased to present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Norman Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be back uh, here in Cleveland. Uh, my wife is from here and grew up here and went to uh, Shaker Heights High School. And uh, I have uh, actually, we have a lot of uh, family and dear friends uh, who are here today too. That makes it uh, even a little bit uh, more uh, special. Uh, I came in this morning, early this morning from Washington. Uh, when I left, it was 82 and foggy, uh, just like Clint Eastwood. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of course, I came from Washington. I was down in uh, Charlotte uh, a little bit uh, earlier uh, in the week, uh, and uh, it was an interesting experience. I thought, uh, actually, of course, uh, last night they had to move uh, the convention uh, from uh, where it was going to be, which was the Bank of America Stadium, back to where it had been before, uh, which was the Time Warner uh, Arena. And I thought, uh, I wonder what public relations genius decided to highlight uh, bankers and cable companies, uh, the most uh, obviously two uh, institutions Americans love uh, uh, very uh, deeply. Um, uh, Wednesday night, uh, we had uh, quite a night. Uh, you had the convention, you had the first NFL game, and a brand new episode of Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> if, if that doesn't encapsulate what America stands for uh, all in one, uh, I'm not sure uh, what uh, does. Uh, one of the highlights, of course, was Michelle Obama's uh, speech, uh, which was praised by everybody. Uh, even Fox News, called, Fox News called it not the worst speech. Uh, so <laughs> that was pretty good. And uh, then, of course, uh, before that, we had Tampa. Actually, when I was in uh, Charlotte, I got drenched 
uh, because the tail end of uh, Hurricane Isaac actually had moved its way up and through North Carolina. But of course, uh, the drama in Tampa was uh, mostly about uh, the hurricane. Uh, the uh, conditions, uh, predictions were so bad that uh, Donald Trump canceled uh, his uh, appearance. Uh, who says there aren't good things that come with, uh, with hurricanes? Uh, but I think my uh, favorite moment was when uh, Herman Cain uh, was asked about the hurricane and was asked if he remembered Katrina. And he said, I never met her, I don't know her, <laughs> nobody has any proof at all. <laughs> Early on, uh, there were actually very dire predictions and uh, there was at least some overreaction, uh, in particular when I saw Rick Santorum at the uh, Tampa Zoo gathering up two of every creature. I thought that may be, may be overdoing it uh, a little bit. Uh, in Charlotte, uh, I picked up a couple of campaign buttons, and I think my favorite one was a uh, button with the picture of Jenna Jameson uh, on it. Jenna Jameson is perhaps the most famous porn star in America, and she has, I kid you not, endorsed Mitt Romney, saying, I'm rich, of course I'm gonna vote for Mitt Romney. <laughs> And my thought was, the Democrats are losing the porn star vote? That never would have happened under Bill Clinton. Uh, so. Uh, there were some striking differences at the conventions. I must say, uh, in Tampa, as I watched the convention floor, I thought uh, if we have a, uh, a theme for it, it would be Fifty Shades of White. Uh, it was not exactly a, a diverse uh, group. Uh, uh, then we had, of course, the speeches from the candidates, and Mitt Romney pledged that if he's elected president, uh, he will create 12 million new jobs, and that's just for people who do his taxes. Uh, so. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, I am uh, uh, here in significant part uh, because I have this book out. Uh, it's even worse than it looks. Uh, uh, by the way, it makes a great holiday gift. Uh, and, <laughs> Any holiday, doesn't matter uh, what it may be. Uh, but it's a book that I wrote with my co-author in the last uh, uh, year. Uh, we actually wrote it on a pretty uh, accelerated timetable because we were concerned about the state of American uh, politics and governance. I abandoned uh, along the way another book that I'd been writing. I've been in Washington now for over 40 years, immersed in our politics and uh, policy process. And I decided it, had been, it was time to write a memoir. And I was inspired by the best-selling memoir of our times. Of course, that's Sarah Palin's Going Rogue. Uh, so I tentatively entitled mine Going Rogaine. Uh, and my alternate title was Going Several Times a Night. Uh, I know my target audience, and many of them right here in, in this room. Uh, I'm actually pretty good with uh, book titles. Uh, when uh, Dick Cheney was writing uh, his memoir, uh, I suggested that he call it the Angina Monologues. Uh, but <laughs> he didn't take my advice, uh, as he never does. Uh, but that book, of course, became a big bestseller, although the critics were brutal. They said reading it was like torture. And I thought that was so unfair. It was more like an enhanced interrogation technique, uh, in, in my view. So uh, we have this very interesting presidential contest. Uh, some of the drama in the last couple of weeks uh, came with the uh, uh, choice of a running mate for Mitt Romney. We always focus a fair amount on that. A few weeks before the choice was made, his uh, spokesman predicted that Romney would choose, and I quote, an incredibly boring white guy. And Joe Biden said, why not? It worked for Obama. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, it was an interesting process, and for a long time I figured uh, he would choose uh, Newt Gingrich because I thought it was the perfect balance ticket. You get a Mormon and a polygamist. Uh, but... <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, then I was kind of hoping he would choose uh, Ron Paul. Uh, I've been rooting for Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul, of course, is for legalization of prostitution and legalization of drugs, and I just wanted to be at the victory party. As, as <laughs> uh, I've got a lot more, but uh, we are limited in time. 
but I do like to uh, get people laughing because it's all downhill uh, from, from this point on. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, in this part of the program is uh, talk a little bit, uh, stepping back, about uh, the broader context, and that is uh, the nature of the uh, dysfunction in which we find ourselves, and uh, uh, I'll come back to that as we look ahead to how we can deal with some of these deep problems facing us. And then I'll give you a little bit of a, a sense, my sense, of the presidential uh, landscape as we go forward in uh, the final uh, roughly 60 days uh, before we have this quite important and pivotal election. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Tom Mann and I uh, wrote uh, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, and the uh, title tells you what you need to know in some ways about where we are. Uh, because of the sense of urgency that we uh, felt uh, about our political process uh, in the 40-plus years that we have been uh, immersed in Washington politics, we've never seen it this dysfunctional. And there's plenty of dysfunction. And it's not as if our political system was designed to be smooth running and uh, efficient, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, it was expected uh, by the framers that we would have an enormous amount of contentiousness, uh, that it would be difficult to reach decisions, that, uh, in fact, uh, it was designed to make it more difficult to reach those uh, decisions. Uh, and that's how it usually operates. And it doesn't look good. It never looks good. But as we say in the title, uh, it's even worse than it looks right now for a whole host of reasons, some of which go back several decades, some of which are more recent. The fundamental, which you know quite well, is, of course, we have a level of polarization, partisan and ideological, that's simply sharper than we have seen uh, in our lifetimes. And it's not just that it's partisan. It's become tribal. Uh, now, there's a difference. Uh, partisanship is built into the DNA of a democratic political system. Parties aren't mentioned in the Constitution, but they developed early on almost immediately. You need to have ways to organize differences in viewpoint that people feel. You need to have ways to organize elections so that you can have winners and losers, and it's clear how that works. You need to have ways to organize institutions so you can have an orderly transfer of power and enable them to operate, and that's what parties do. But for much of our lifetimes, at least, while parties had sharp differences, they also found ways to work together and could find a common ground. When it becomes tribal, it's not about what the ideas are. It's about who expresses those ideas. And frankly, we have seen so many examples of tribalism over the last couple of years uh, that uh, uh, underscore the problem not the least of them being the Affordable Care Act. The fact is that the health reform plan known as Obamacare is fundamentally the Republican alternative to the Clinton health care plan that emerged in 1993 and 1994. It's a law that was drafted by people like the late Senator John Chafee of Rhode Island, uh, by the former uh, Republican senator from Minnesota, uh, Dave Dernberger, with whom I've discussed this numerous times, and by uh, people like uh, current senators Chuck Grassley and Orrin Hatch. As you know, many of those ideas flowed from conservative think tanks and other places, and that includes not just the individual mandate, but the whole idea of health insurance exchanges. Now, you graph that onto the Romney health care plan in Massachusetts, and you've got the Affordable Care Act, by and large. It is not socialism. There isn't a public option in it. It relies on private insurance and premium support. And I heard as recently as five years ago, even four years ago, Orrin Hatch giving a stirring defense of an individual mandate. Uh, and talking about how the way to go was health insurance exchanges. And then I saw him on the floor talking about the march to socialism that was represented by this act. Is it because he had suddenly decided that all the ideas that he had embraced several years ago were now uh, uh, obviously so wrong that he must have been hypnotized along the way? 
No, it's because of who's promoting those ideas. And we've seen it as it flows through things like the Simpson-Bowles plan, uh, when you actually do find people outside the political process coming together in a bipartisan way, and across a whole host of other areas. Uh, it makes action in a political process more difficult. Now that tribalism is underscored, though, by another set of realities, which is that our parties, which for most of the time that I was around Washington, the early years, had very significant centers and had a considerable amount of overlap. The Democratic Party had in the 70s and into the 80s and really going back to the 50s, nearly half of its members dwindling down to about 40 percent who were more conservative, centrist and conservative, mostly from the South. We used to call these Southern conservative Democrats boll weevils or that insect that infects cotton in the South. The Republican Party had through most of that time 25 to 30 percent of its members who were moderates and liberals. We used to call them gypsy moths for that bug that infects hardwood trees, mostly in the Northeast. But we underwent a very substantial and dramatic regional realignment in American politics where the South, which was the bastion uh, of Democratic Party support, gradually became the base and strongest element of the Republican Party. And not only that, although it's not uh, uniformly Republican, as it was for a long time, uh, uh, almost uh, all made up of Democrats, but uh, the Democratic Party ranks in the South have changed very substantially to a point where after this election, there may be no more than a handful or fewer in the Confederate states of white Democrats. The Democrats who remain are minority members. The redistricting process and a variety of other changes have caused another realignment in that region. And at the same time, the Northeast, New England, which were bastions of the moderate Republicans, the West Coast, which had people like Mark Hatfield and uh, Bob Packwood and Tom Keekle, moderate Republicans in the Senate, Oregon, Washington, California have now become the bluest states uh, in the country. And of course, as a consequence, moderate Republicans have become at best a trace element uh, in that party. And uh, there are none left in the House and fewer than a handful in the Senate. And uh, moderate Democrats remain a part of the Democratic Party. But those numbers have been cut in half uh, through the last election and will be cut again uh, this time around. <laughs> Now, those sharp differences have created parties that operate more like parliamentary parties. And the frank reality is parliamentary parties can do very well in a parliamentary system where you have a majority that acts and the minority that uniformly, vociferously opposes, but the majority gets its program enacted because they work together. And everybody in the system accepts those actions as legitimate. That's the way it works. And they know that within a matter of a few years, they're going to have an election where it's clear who's accountable, and they can act on that accountability. But in our political system, and our political culture, it doesn't work. First of all, the framers who designed this system with its cantankerousness and contentiousness also understood that if you're going to reach decisions, making policy, that inevitably means things will be shaken up for people. In what they called an extended republic, this vast geographic expanse, which given the transportation realities of the uh, 18th uh, and early 19th century, meant that it could take weeks or months to travel uh, from different parts of the country to Washington with people coming from dramatically different backgrounds and living dramatically different lives, ranging from the uh, uh, rural areas where people might literally, uh, to use Joe Biden's favorite word, not see another human being for months, to the most densely packed urban areas back then, far more than anything that we have now, how are you going to get everybody to agree? Well, the answer was you bring them together, in Washington, we call it a Congress. Congress comes from the Latin word to come together. 
parliamentary system, the parliament comes from the French word parler, to speak, because the parliament doesn't do much. It's the government for wh through which they are the action that acts. The idea was you'd bring people together, they would interact, they would see things from other people's perspectives, and over a period of time, they'd come to a consensus. And it might not be one that everybody loved, but all the actors would see it as legitimate because they would have had an opportunity to have their say. And the idea was that you would build a broader leadership consensus that could convince this disparate population that the short-term pain that we would incur was worth the benefit that would flow from it. That's never an easy thing to do uh, for anything in life. I was uh, reflecting on it last week as I sat in the dentist chair, uh, and actually even a little bit more a few months earlier when I was uh, uh, undergoing the procedures before the next day's colonoscopy. Uh, <laughs> nobody likes to accept short-term pain for what is a promise that may or may not come of long-term gain. But we accept it from authorities like our gastroenterologists or our dentists. We don't from politicians because we start with a belief that there's something uh, that isn't quite right there anyhow and they can't be trusted. That's why we need broad bipartisan leadership consensus when we take significant actions for social change. Well, in a parliamentary system, a majority can act, and in the first two years of the Obama administration, there were periods when that majority could act, and indeed we saw a spate of legislative activity that rivaled, at least if not eclipsing, the 89th Congress, the uh, famous Great Society Congress under Lyndon Johnson. But we've complicated matters in our tribal politics, where even under those circumstances, you can't act because majority's not enough. Now you need 60 votes in the Senate. That's new. We've never had that before. The filibuster was never used as a routine instrument to delay or obstruct. It was used in a very small number of areas uh, where there were major national issues and uh, deep uh, feelings on the part of a minority. But now it's become an almost routine thing. But even there, we had the ability to act and get those things done. But if, because they were done with one party, with the unified, uniform opposition of a party acting as a parliamentary minority party, they were seen by half the populace as illegitimate. And there were active efforts made to delegitimize them uh, afterwards, including the refusal in the Senate to confirm anybody, uh, no matter what the qualifications, for uh, positions to lead uh, institutions like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the central post for implementing the Affordable Care Act. It's also something we've never seen before. You can block presidential nominations and have in many instances because of a belief that these are people who are not qualified uh, or who have some moral issues. But we had nominees for those posts coming up where there was a universal acceptance that they were well-qualified and sterling, exemplary uh, people, but we're not going to confirm them because we don't want the laws that have been lawfully enacted to be implemented. That's a difference from a parliamentary system. But then, of course, we moved after the 2010 elections to the true nightmare that happens if you have parliamentary parties in a system with separation of powers, which is divided government, and what you get is gridlock. And in fact, what we've had for the 112th Congress is the smallest set of outputs in terms of laws enacted in our lifetimes and even before. And it makes the famous do-nothing Congress, the 80th Congress that Harry Truman ran on in 1946, uh, 47, 48, uh, look extraordinarily good by comparison. Of course, the fact is when Truman ran against the 80th do-nothing Congress, it ignored some realities. That 80th Congress passed the Marshall Plan. Uh, any Congress that did that could go home and would be seen as historic. Also did a number of other very important things, reorganize, reorganizing our national security apparatus, uh, uh, creating a fundamental framework for uh, dealing with economic policy. Uh, so it was quite productive, but this one has not been. And of the pitiful number of laws passed, almost a third of them are renaming or naming post offices. Uh, the most significant action of this Congress 
was the debacle over the debt limit that led to the first downgrade in America's credit in history. And that's what happens when you have a parliamentary minority party that acts uh, in that fashion, but in a system that simply can't tolerate it. And it's not surprising as a consequence, not just because we have managed barely to segue through uh, without utter disaster, the worst economic conditions uh, over an extended period of time since the Great Depression, uh, but also because uh, while Americans increasingly themselves are divided into tribes, there's still this overall sentiment that we hire you people to solve problems, solve the damn problems. And the big problem we have is there is no problem solving caucus anymore the way we used to have one. It is less ideology and more a mindset. So no surprise that Congress has bumped along this last year with the lowest approval rating since we've been measuring such things. Most recent poll I saw had approval at 9%. John McCain is fond of saying that he and his colleagues are down to blood relatives and paid staff. <laughs> and, and I know John's uh, relatives, and they're pretty shaky uh, on that <laughs> front uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, but unlike a parliamentary system, we can't easily gauge accountability. And figuring out who to blame when you're not happy with what's going on is one of the great challenges that Americans face right now as we approach what is a pivotal election. And it's an election where, uh, as both candidates have really said uh, at their conventions and in their speeches, the choices are starker than we've had before in terms of worldview and the likely policies that they would end up pursuing. At the same time, the choices may be starker, but the willingness to actually lay out specifics of a program have not been very great or very stark. Uh, you know, when Chris Christie came onto the stage at the Republican Convention, it actually reminded me that 100 years ago uh, we had that famous 1912 election. It didn't remind me because of Teddy Roosevelt running on the Bull Moose Party ticket, but he reminded me of William Howard Taft. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who get the reference, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> but he gave this you know, stirring speech in which he said, we're going to be tough. We're going to give you the tough choices. We're going to tell the American people what we really believe. We're going to tell you what we're going to do. And as he stood there and said, we're going to tell you what we're going to do, and I'm going to tell seniors, we've got to tackle the entitlements. We've got this looming debt crisis. We've got to act now. And we can only do it by t hitting spending. And the biggest spending area is those entitlements. And I was thinking, OK, so what you're saying is we're going to tackle Medicare, but not for 10 years. We're going to leave it alone. We're going to leave Social Security untouched for 10 years. Then we've got a plan to deal with them. Well, that doesn't seem to me to be giving people the tough language that presumably you're talking about. And the same is true when you begin to look at the budget plans that suggests that they're going to carve enormous amounts out of government and government spending, but all of it focused on a sliver, less than an eighth of the budget, which is discretionary domestic spending, which is most of what we know of as government. And if you look at those budget plans and put them together, say, all right, we've got the Bush tax cuts being made permanent, more tax cuts which will be paid for by unspecified loophole closing. The problem there, of course, being that the loopholes you'd have to close to pay for a dramatic cut in tax rates start with state and local tax deductions, municipal bond uh, deductions, health insurance deductions, uh, mortgage deductions, and charitable contributions. That's about 85% of where the revenue uh, is in uh, the deduction process. Uh, but leaving all of that aside and assuming that those tax cuts would be revenue neutral, the latter ones, and you're going to leave Medicare and Social Security aside, and you're going to fulfill a pledge to cut Medicaid by 30 percent and turn it into a block grant, uh, you're left with what would amount to 40 percent cuts in everything else in government other than defense by 2016. Now, why not talk about what those things are? Because most Americans, I was just with uh, the Pew Research Center pollster who's done a big study on 
uh, Americans who want to cut government, except when you ask them every specific area other than foreign aid, they don't want to cut it. And that's because you're talking about food safety, air traffic control, the FBI, homeland security, education, health research, and a host of other areas that people don't view as having enormous amounts of waste, fraud, and abuse. So we're not getting a real discussion there. And both candidates have talked only elliptically about how they would embrace plans like Simpson-Bowles or something that would be bipartisan without getting to the specifics, which would have to include, if you're dealing with spending, uh, grappling with Medicare now, uh, whether it's that $716 billion that's become famous that we're uh, all in the Ryan budget as they are in uh, the uh, Obama plan with the Affordable Care Act, uh, and uh, dealing with Medicaid, but keep in mind, as Bill Clinton said the other night, that Medicaid has as its single largest expense by far long-term care for the elderly. Uh, and uh, the second component of that, which is very much related, is what we call the dual eligibles, which is disabled elderly who are on Medicaid and Social Security. And I'm not sure many Americans want to hear uh, what is the true nightmare, which is the doorbell rings, and there are your mother and father-in-law, suitcase in one hand, carton of Depends in the other, saying uh, Medicaid isn't going to pay for this anymore. Get that back uh, bedroom upstairs ready for us. Neither the seniors nor their children want that to happen. And so we're not ready to face the tough realities of where those changes have to come from, much less the reality that we uh, need revenue. We're at the lowest point revenue at 15% of GDP that we've been in 60 years. And with a population that's aging and the expenses are going to be greater no matter what, making those two come together cannot be done with spending alone. Uh, but nobody wants to see significant tax increases. And frankly, when President Obama says, we're only going to hit the wealthy, that's not going to do it. All of us are going to have to uh, uh, pony up to that particular bar as well. So with all of that, and coming out of the conventions, where are we? The reality is we are in what almost certainly will be a very close election. Very close, despite the fact that incumbent presidents have enormous advantages, despite what I believe pretty objectively was a much better Democratic convention uh, than the Republican convention was, which went just fine, but this one had a much higher level of enthusiasm and in many ways a better framing. But it's going to stay close. It'll stay close because the economy, as we saw with the jobs report today, is not going to do anything better than bump along uh, near the bottom. Moving up gradually, uh, it is improving, but in a very slow way, which, by the way, is what almost inevitably happens after uh, a significant downturn caused by a financial crisis where you have the dilemma that you build up enormous debt, public and private, and you have to deleverage that debt, but you can't do it too quickly or you uh, uh, go down even further. And yet, to stimulate means you build up even more debt. It's very difficult to get out of that and to deal with an employment problem that comes from it. So it's not going to be a plus for the president. We're going to see a very different campaign than we usually do in terms of money. And I feel for you here in Ohio. Because since Citizens United, uh, the amount of money that's going to be unleashed in this process in ads is unprecedented. The big winners in this campaign are local television stations. Revenues are going to be up by 25% or more. And it's no wonder that they have bitterly opposed any disclosure uh, because they don't want to cut into their own revenues. But if you're in a state like Ohio, where you have a pivotal Senate race and a presidential contest uh, that may be on the line, you are not going to be able to avoid, unless you get the best TiVo money can buy, <laughs> having a flood of negative ads from candidates and from outside groups that will make you feel like the equivalent of a goose being force-fed for the foie gras over the next two months. <laughs> And there is no refuge anymore. You perhaps saw the story a couple of weeks ago that ESPN was aggressively seeking to fill its own ad bank with uh, those political uh, commercials. And that's not going to make people feel any better about the political process or reduce the level of tribalism. 
And of course, the big advantage with the outside money now is uh, on the Republican side. All it takes is one or two people, a Sheldon Adelson here, a Koch brother there, to put in what is pocket change uh, for them, but what will be able to buy up all the prime ad time. Uh, so that's something where the traditional advantage of an incumbent in money is at least negated, if not more so. The other element to keep in mind is something that you're seeing here in Ohio very well, uh, as in many other states, which is a series of voter suppression measures. You can call them voter ID if you want. You can talk about voter integrity. But the bottom line is they're voter suppression measures. And it's actually been striking at officials in this state who have been honest about it. We don't want African Americans to vote. Why should we encourage that? Uh, this is like the new Bull Connor. Um, and I frankly view your Secretary of State as being like the new George Wallace in many ways, uh, too. Uh, so Ohio may be a leader in that front, but there are many other states. And how those play out, including if there is a close contest, and I fear another 2,000, but this time not with one Florida, with six, eight, or ten of them, where there'll be massive numbers of provisional ballots and where we may not accept the legitimacy of the outcome. But all of that keeps it close. And finally, what keeps it close is that uh, we have an evenly divided country. We have about a third of Americans who identify directly as Democrats, a third who identify as Republicans, and a third who identify as independents. But two-thirds of the last third lean to one party or the other. And we know from a lot of research that the independents who lean to the Democrats vote just like the Democrats, and the independents who lean to the Republicans vote just like the Republicans. So that leaves 10 percent of the electorate truly independent. Divide them in two. Half are deeply engaged and involved and follow what's going on, and the other half pay almost no attention. They're not identified with the party because they don't care. They watch uh, uh, Boo Boo. Uh, <laughs> although you'll we'll probably see political commercials there, too. Uh, they won't be able to avoid it. And they're classic referendum voters. Times are good, they vote the ins, and times are bad, they vote the outs, if they vote at all. So it's an election that will be decided by 4 to 8 percent, perhaps, of persuadable voters, and that's going to keep it pretty close until right before the end. Incumbent has an advantage, but it's not a big enough advantage where outside forces could make a difference. And yet, there's one clear outcome that flows from this, and that is there is almost nothing out there that will break a logjam, or that if it does, if we get one party with all the reins of power ready to act, and Paul Ryan, long before he was chosen as uh, the running mate, laid out as chairman of the Budget Committee the plan, which was to, uh, if they win everything, do the mother of all reconciliation bills, use a process where you can avoid a filibuster in the Senate, and implement pretty dramatic and revolutionary change to reduce the scope of domestic government, uh, to increase defense, and to cut taxes further, and to obliterate the Affordable Care Act. But that would be done just as we saw in the first two years of the Obama administration, with a country divided down the middle and in a purely partisan way, and is not likely to lead to a set of outcomes that will have us feeling better about things. We have big challenges ahead. Both candidates were much better at recounting the big challenges we have than talking about the ways in which we can deal with them. But the fact is we are not going to be able to deal with those challenges unless we can find a problem-solving mechanism or a problem-solving ethos. And uh, I have to say uh, that uh, that's not a very pleasing prospect in the short run. We came close. That super committee was this close to actually giving us a bipartisan agreement to deal with the debt and tribalism took over again, and that's why we have these sequesters looming, among other things. We may see, for the first time, a reaction from the business community, which has been absent without leave in this entire debate, because it's gotten caught up in the tribalism, or even the financial community, as uh, the prospect of uh, fiscal disaster looms. But in the absence of that, fasten your seatbelts for a rocky ride. And I do want to end on an upbeat note. Uh, my business couldn't be better. Uh, so. <laughs> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Norman J. Ornstein, political scientist and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. 
We will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club questions. Please formulate questions now and remember to keep them brief and to the point and in the form of a question. We welcome all of you here and those listening to 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WBIZ PBS Idea Stream. Our television uh, broadcasts um, of the City Club are made possible by, possible by Cleveland State University and PNC Bank. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Closed captioning for our programs is made possible by the Nordstrom Corporation. Today, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker and Hostetler and Key Bank. Thank you for your support. Today's forum is the Michael Michelson Endowed Forum. Mike was a longtime City Club member and an active member of the Special Programs Committee. With us today are Mike's widow, Susan Michelson, and his daughters, Linda and Debbie. Will you please stand to be recognized? Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today uh, are City Club 100th Anniversary Assistant Director Betsy Wallace and Program Director Carrie Miller. May we have the first question. <clears throat> My question is, if we went to an open uh, primary where the right now the, both the parties yeah. lean towards the extremists, would that help solve the problem? That's a very good question. And uh, let me say that uh, the last half of uh, this uh, book, it's not, uh, OK. I'll you just have to use this. Uh, the last half of the book, uh, it's even worse than it looks, makes a great holiday gift. Uh, <laughs> the last half is what to do or what not to do. And open primaries <laughs> is one of the things that we recommend. Um, we have to get away from a politics that is dominated by the bases and by the extreme uh, minorities. Now, if I had my druthers, I would wave a magic wand and implement the Australian system of mandatory attendance at the polls. In Australia, you don't have to vote. You can vote for none of the above. But if you don't show up at the polls and you don't come up with an excuse, you can write a letter saying, I was sick, I was traveling, the dog ate my uh, registration card. Uh, if you don't do that, you're subject to a fine of roughly $15. Now, that may not sound like much. In the District of Columbia, uh, we have a tax on bags at grocery stores and uh, uh, at, at drug stores of five cents. And it's really funny to watch people walking out balancing the cans because they'll be damned if they're going to pay five cents for a bag. <laughs> so these incentives matter. Before Australia implemented the system, they had attendance uh, or turnout of about 50%. Now it's over 90% in every election. Now, it's not just that you get a high turnout and you feel good about it. The former Soviet Union had a 98% turnout. It wasn't exactly a sign of functionality. Chicago on a good day gets to 110%. Uh, <laughs> but what Australian politicians will tell you is they don't have base-driven politics. They don't have the Carl Roves or the James Carvilles trying to make sure that you scare the bejesus out of your base to get them out and suppress the other side's base. If you know that both bases are going to be there, you focus on the voters in the middle. And that means you change the issues you talk about. You don't talk so much about wedge issues like abortion or same-sex relationships or guns. You talk about the big things that matter. And you don't use vitriolic rhetoric because that may turn on a base, but it turns off the voters in the middle. But we're not going to do that. We don't like mandatory anything. My fallback on that front is to turn from a, a penalty to an incentive, a mega vote, mega lottery, where your ticket for the lottery is your vote stub. And uh, you know, if you watched people wait in line all night to get that ticket for the one in 176 million chance that you'd win $300 million, we could do a lot with that. But in the absence of both of those things, I go for open primaries that move away from the party's base with preference voting, where if there are third and fourth parties, then uh, you don't skew it towards one side or the other. You get uh, a, a better representation, and you're going to end up with more candidates who represent the middle and aren't scared by the base than we have now. Bernstein, you, on several occasions, yes. you, you referred to the Bowles-Simpson Commission report. Yeah. 
Um, as we know, this is a, a, a eleven of the eighteen supported it, five R's, five D's, and one independent. On the day it, the report came out, unfortunately, the president was in Afghanistan. Senator Simpson came here last fall and spoke and made the statement that uh, even President Clinton strongly advised the president to wrap his arms around that report, take full credit for it, and he and everything would come out fine. My question to you, sir, is why did President uh, uh, Obama not support it or endorse it? But, and, and to the extent if he did or Mr. Romney would do it, would that deal with the dealing, uh, help the, significantly the problems we're faced? That's a, it's a very good question, and I think the, uh, if we're looking at the biggest failing of President Obama, it was the failure, uh, not just, you don't have, didn't have to embrace the report. As I watched his State of the Union message after the Simpson-Bowles report came out, I was waiting for him to say, we had this commission, and I may not like every part of it, you may not like every part of it, but I am demanding that you and Congress turn it into a legislative package, and then let's get a vote on it. Uh, and I think the failure to do that was a big mistake. Now, I also have to say, I've talked to Al Simpson, uh, who is an old friend and with whom I've worked on many issues, and he has now a little bit more of a perspective on this, and what he'll say is, you know, I can kind of understand it, because the way things have been going, if he had embraced it, then it would have been tribal. They automatically would have opposed it. And there's reason to believe that. You recall that there were two other plans, similar ones, same template. The Rivlin Domenici Commission, which actually in many ways had better ideas, came out of the Bipartisan Policy Center, and that gang of six in the Senate, spanning the political spectrum from the very conservative Tom Coburn to the liberal Dick Durbin. And when that plan came out, the president embraced it warmly. The day that he did, political reporter Mike Allen got an email from the top aide, a top aide, to the Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell saying, in effect, well, that kills that. If he's for it, we're against it. So that's a problem. Now, I don't think that's an adequate excuse. And I think he should have embraced it. And he's inched in that direction. He sort of hinted at it last night. And by the way, it'll also tell you something about our tribal politics. This was a presidential commission that was fairly weak. They needed that supermajority. And even then, they had no guarantee that they'd get the votes in Congress because it was presidentially appointed. Before that, there had been an idea for a congressional commission with teeth. It was co-sponsored in a bipartisan way by moderate Democrat Kent Conrad of North Dakota and a conservative Republican Senator uh, Judd Gregg from uh, New Hampshire. Uh, every day for a year, practically speaking, Mitch McConnell took to the floor and said, what we really need is the, uh, is the Greg Conrad Commission. We could solve this problem if we get the Greg Conrad Commission. Why won't the president support the Greg Conrad Commission? And then he did, and they brought it up for a vote. And seven original Republican co-sponsors of it voted against their own commission, as did Mitch McConnell. There were still 53 votes for it. But it died because it was filibustered and they needed 60. Why? Because if he's for it, we're against it. So when you get into that kind of an atmosphere, it makes it more difficult. Now, I'll go back and say, all of that taken into account, the president has the bully pulpit. The president is the opinion leader here. Everybody knows what we need to do. We've got as a minimum to do uh, uh, $4 trillion in debt reduction over 10 years. You don't want to start right now. You want to ease into it. And it's got to be balanced. It's got to include every area of spending, and it's got to have revenues. We all know that. There are minor differences significant but minor with all the templates, but that's the template. And the more we wait to do it, the harder it becomes. Uh, so I put that down as the biggest failing that I've seen. Um, Norm, first of all, this does make an excellent holiday gift. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be even more valuable with your signature yes. on the inside <laughs> cover a little bit later. Um, just an observation that you've, you've said that Congress, for better or for worse, was still functional for the past, almost up into the 90s. And then something happened. You referred to it as a kind of a morphing into a tribal almost mentality. It would seem to me that something like that doesn't happen on its own, that there were probably outside environmental influences that pushed the members of our Congress to behave in a sense to behave yeah. that way. Can you speak a little bit 
to what you believe are some of the, those influences that may even be sustaining this degree of inflexibility and in, in, in action right now. And you're exactly right. This is, uh, a, a lot of it is uh, cultural now, and it's affected by changes in the culture. We have a much different culture. We have a different media culture, of course. We have, in some ways, what you could say is back to the future. We had partisan media in the 19th century, of course. Uh, we have them back now. But it's different because of the breadth and the reach and the immediacy and the reinforcement and amplification that come from the social media. Uh, all of that creates more of a tribal division because we're now cocooning into areas where we read and uh, uh, hear and see things that just reinforce what we already believe. And it means we move away from a public square with a common set of facts uh, that you start with. Uh, and you have a set of facts that aren't factual anymore in many cases. And of course, we also now live in a culture where lying brings you no sense of shame or approbation, but instead, if you lie and you get caught in a lie, you double down on it, and maybe you get your own cable television show. Uh, or if you're a politician, you get a lot of money coming in, uh, but it doesn't hurt you uh, at all. And you can see what happens when these lies go out, and then you get emails. We all get them. You get things referred to you from your closest friends and relatives, and it gives an automatic credibility to them if they're coming from those sources. But a lot of them are viral emails that are filled with things that are simply not true and that just reinforce all of that. So that makes it harder for people to break through. I did a, uh, uh, apropos of your question, it's not so much Congress. I was out in Aspen uh, a couple of weeks ago and I uh, uh, moderated a conversation for an hour with John Huntsman. And I said to Huntsman, uh, you know, I knew the moment when you had zero chance of winning a Republican nomination. I said it came in the debate when you said, you know, maybe those scientists have something to tell us. <laughs> and he nodded and he said, you're right. He said, because we now live in a, an alternative universe. And it's one where it doesn't matter what we believed two or three years ago or what we say now, you've got to pass these litmus tests. And I can tell you, because I know most of them, there are still plenty of problem solvers on both sides of the aisle, and there are plenty of, plenty of problem solvers on the Republican side, including in the House. It has nothing to do with ideology. Bob Bennett was one of the five most conservative members of the Senate by voting record in Utah when he was denied the chance even to run for renomination for his seat because he violated some of those orthodoxies. And now, if you step outside the orthodoxy, whether it is on climate change or on the no taxes pledge or in a host of other areas, then at minimum, you're going to have a multi-million dollar challenge from the Club for Growth from the outside or some other organization. And you know your main uh, problem is going to be in a primary. And I can tell you the House of Representatives next time you have 20 or so of the Tea Party freshmen who were challenged in primaries from the right because they'd gone Washington, which meant they voted for something, anything. <laughs> well, most of them survived those challenges. But what's the lesson you learn from that? It is, if you work with the other side, the big target's on your back, and it's coming from the primary side. So all of that has made a difference, and it's made it harder to act. And then you've got one other problem here, which is a broader societal problem. All institutions, save the military, have uh, basically been cast aside by Americans as being credible or worthy, and that means the leaders of all those institutions. You see it in higher education. You see it in religion, uh, pretty obviously. Uh, you see it uh, in business. You see it in the financial world. You see it in law almost everywhere. Uh, that means that leaders in a populist age when the economy is bad have no credibility. Getting people to go along with things that they otherwise wouldn't do because you're a leader and you're telling them that that's the way to go just doesn't have any cachet anymore. And you see that very clearly with poor John Boehner who at times when he's tried to work things out and I think 
He is uh, instinctively a legislator. He wants to kind of get things done. He doesn't have his troops behind him. And of course, the other leaders say, we've got your back with Dirk in hand. Uh, so it's very, very difficult under those circumstances uh, to, uh, to make it operate. And so what's been a mildly dysfunctional institution moving towards a more dysfunctional institution has moved almost to crisis point. I think the Senate actually has uh, some potential next time. I've talked to people like Lamar Alexander, Bob Corker. They, want, they don't want to vote no. They want to solve problems. But the House, forget about it. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Norman Ornstein, political scientist and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and author of It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. And I can't help myself but to say it is a great holiday gift. Thank you, Mr. Ornstein. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. is proud to support the presentation of this City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum on WVIZ PBS. Additional support comes from Cleveland State University. Support for closed caption transcripts of City Club forums is provided by the Nordson Corporation Foundation.